welcome back. This is Boris Kubo with more Let's Play Xenosaga Episode 1. I am joined, as always, by my Gnosis hunting squad of Xion Cosmos and Virgil. When we last left off, we were on board the Woglinde being attacked by Gnosis. We're still on the Woglinde being attacked by Gnosis, but we have more database entries to go over. It's going to be a little bit of a session this time going through the database entries. There's almost nothing here on Gnosis. We have Manticores. Um, but that is it. And I don't even have analysis info on them. So um, I don't know what the point of all that is. But we do have a few new keywords. I'll be honest, nothing that important. I have started putting uh, annotations in the video so that you can skip this uh, if, if this is not your thing. First up, we do have congestion, which is like, why is this even here? Yes, congestion, when there's excessive traffic on anything. I understand that. Uh, counselor, I think we went over... Yes. Uh, creator and creation. Very small, once again, refers to the creator and all life created by it. So there's God and man, and man and reality, and two different sets of creator and creation. Then we also have Digibeta, uh, which is how they say to say it. It's short for Digitalis Beta. It's apparently a real plant. Uh, plant of the genus Digitalis, which is native to southern Europe. It's uh, a potent cardiotonic. I'm not exactly sure ex what that is. I know heart something. It is also extremely poisonous when just in quantities above a safe dosage, it can induce a coma. I don't know if it's supposed to like reduce heart rate. That's, that's what I would assume. Uh, inside the game, they're kind of covering their ass. They're like, uh, well, it is dig Digibeta, but, you know, in case we did something that's a little off, it's something very similar to Digibeta, and that's basically that, that, what that last sentence says. It's definitely their way of covering their ass. Then we have dual-stage protection, something to do with the central nervous system of Reallians, but details are currently unknown. Thanks, game. There's That was a good thing to put in there. Emergency level 3, this is what we were on in the Woglin Day when the Gnosis attacked, judging from the fact that all lines of communication were allocated to the Command Intelligence Center. This emergency level is apparently invoked during Gnosis encounters. Now, a lot of this stuff seems pretty obvious right now, uh, simply because we just experienced it, and that's all the information they're giving us, really. We also have Fuel Air Explosive. These are, these are real. Uh, this is a real thing. Uh, conventional FAEs disperse a cloud of fuel, which is then ignited once it reaches the intended coverage, resulting in a powerful explosion. So basically, I spray methane everywhere, wait until it gets the right air to methane ratio, normal air, I should say, to, to methane ratio, light it on fire. Uh, those in close proximity to this explosion will either be flattened by the massive pressure wave, incinerated by the extremely high heat, or suffer the effects of rapid decompression caused by the updraft of superheated air, mainly suffocation and internal hemorrhage. That last one sounds awful, let me tell you. It sounds like your insides are trying to, to shoot out your mouth. That's what that sounds like to me. Uh, the largest weapon of this type has a range with a radius of several kilometers. I don't know what they're referring to when it comes to that. Uh, what kind of FAE they're talking about. They're, uh, it's implied that they're talking about a real-world FAE that can fire several kilometers. I don't know if that means that the whole, like, several kilometers will be exploded or if that means we can launch an FAE that far. Very strange. Although the FAE, FAE used by the analysis is smaller, it appears to have the same effects. However, the substance used as fuel is unknown. Here, by the way, is another mystery. Since Virgil was inside an eggs, his survival can be explained. But how could Xion, who was totally unprotected, come out unscathed? It appears that Xion is quite a bit tougher than she looks. Hopefully they do try to come up with some kind of explanation for this, otherwise it's just pointing out their own flaws in game logic. Uh, but Xion definitely has been lucky so far to have survived. That is true. Geodesic structure. Uh, it gives you a little bit about geodesic structure uh, history. Uh, for those of you that don't know what it is, a picture would be great here. Uh, picture the Epcot Center. You know, you know when you hear about uh, Disney World, that large white kind of globe looking thing? That's a geodesic dome. It's pretty much a giant ball made of triangles. <laughs> 
little triangles. Apparently it's supposed to be very efficient and doesn't use as much resources. I, I'm no architect, I have no idea how that would work, but if you say so, sure. Uh, this name is used to describe the visual representation of a basic UMN structure since it resembles the shape of a geodesic dome. Uh, so apparently the UMN is built like a geodesic structure. I don't know how important that is to know. Uh, Gnosis! Uh, entities shrouded in mystery, of which the only known attribute is their hostility toward mankind. Gnosis exists in a unique dimension separate from the physical plane, therefore it is not normally impossible to come into contact with them. Sorry, therefore it is normally impossible to come into contact with them. Due to the variations in external appearance, the Staren practice is to name them after mythical creatures, uh, like the goblins that we saw. And who did we fight? Was it the Minotaur that we fought? It was something like that. Uh, what's kind of strange to me is that they, like, we can't interact with them, but they can interact with us. I don't understand the logic of that necessarily, but I, I don't understand quantum mechanics in the first place. Something tells me the game doesn't necessarily either, though. A device which generates a finitely bound realm, a sensory realm to be exact, to en enable an intersection with the imaginary realm. We're talking about the Hilbert effect, by the way. I don't think I mentioned that. I don't like this, that they call something the imaginary realm, since the Gnosis are clearly real. It's not even, it's not even close. Uh, there are specific wave energies that exist in both the realms of real numbers and imaginary numbers. This device interprets such wave energies into a common language, thereby allowing the physical realm to interact with the imaginary realm, the realm of Planck scales. I thought Planck's were real. Uh, this kind of sounds like they're saying that all quantum mechanics, quantum physics, that it's imaginary? I don't know how much I buy that. Pretty sure it exists. Planck scales, by the way, it's it's a really small unit of measurement. I want to say it's like 10 to the minus 9 meters, something like that. It's really small. Um, I want to say like they, they measure atoms and Planck scales. Like that, that's how small Planck's are supposed to be. What this means then is that the Gnosis, which exists outside our physical laws, can effectively be dealt with using a physical real-world approach after the Hilbert effect has been used. There's no way 10 minus 9 meters is Planck scale. But whatever, I forgot the number. It's real small though. <laughs> I know that. Hyperspace, I believe, is new. It's pretty much wormholes and it's shaped like a tube. Thank you, game. That was, that was necessary. Uh, what else do we have here? Lieutenant Commander! He does not get a name, he's just known as Lieutenant Commander. Uh, he's 33, which is pretty old for RPG standards. Uh, he's a member of the UTIC organization and a subordinate of Cherenkov. We don't know what UTIC is. Doesn't have an entry, I can tell you that right now. Uh, we'll get an entry for it, but there's, we don't have one yet. Uh, so we don't know what that is. This is the guy with the giant X across his face. It looks purple to be... I don't know if you guys want to call it magenta. I, I, I won't argue with you. Looked purple to me, though. He infiltrated the Woglinde in order to take possession of the Zohar. He tends to wear his heart on his sleeve, but he is very conscientious of his duties and quite the stickler for regulations and time. He has an older brother whom he was separated from at birth. I think that's a reference to Xenogears. But I could be wrong. Uh, logic Drive. That... I've never really understood what a logic drive is, even though they try to explain it here. A new type of propulsion system which replaced traditional reactionary propulsion systems, in other words, you stone age and your rocket fuel. Uh, it works by reconfiguring the spatial phase around its direction of travel. In other words, it's a warp drive. What it does is it ch actually changes the layout of the space-time continuum where you're traveling. That way you can travel a greater distance without increasing your speed. That way you can travel at a rate that is effectively faster than the speed of light while traveling slower than the speed of light. That's the idea behind the logic drive. So it lets you bypass the uh, speed of light barrier. And it, pretty much every sci-fi has some aspect of, of this. 
<laughs> Substantial amounts of energy are needed to power this system, but since the energy source is relatively easy to compact, the system is being considered for use in fleets with transfer type generators as well as eggs. I don't know what that means. I think they're trying that they're trying to say that they're putting it into smaller and smaller engines, so they're thinking about giving eggs their own logic drives, their own warp drives, which would be insane. Uh, then we have LPS, Local Positioning System, instead of GPS for Global Positioning System. A system which monitors the location and physical status of each crew member within a vessel and reports that information to the Combat Intelligence Center. The LPS on board the Will Glenday, which has a capacity well over the total amount of data gathered, appears to have been overwhelmed by the incessant use of the DSSS by the eggs. I think they call it the DSSS. Uh, I don't remember what it stands for, uh, but the the egg pretty much it was overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that the, the eggs were like, asking for. I guess they're asking for information. Uh, without the support of the 100 series observational units for search and adherence, the eggs must calculate the timing of the interference for the gnosis on their own. This high demands on the DSSS apparently overload the CIC mainframe, which constantly backs up the DSSS of every eggs. Uh, this is a whole bunch of jargon that, to be honest, I don't fully understand. But the impression that I'm getting is that the uh, that the system was overloaded because there were so many eggs uh, asking for information on positions of both themselves and the Gnosis. Uh, I don't understand why this is a big deal. It was pretty clear that guns weren't doing anything to the Gnosis until... Uh, Cosmos showed up and did something about it. All this we have seen before. A lot of empty spots too. Reactor room. As new, it's the engine room. Once again, why do you, why do I even need this? <laughs> Is that really a necessary game? Uh, there are definitely a few of those where it's just like what? But ah, this one. This one's at least interesting. Too close to fire the cannons. In zero-gravity space warfare, a basic rule of engagement is to take into account the possibility of incurring damage to oneself via debris from a destroyed target. During the story, an officer claims we're too close to fire the cannons because the Gnosis were too close to the ship and could not be fired upon for fear of debris damaging the ship. Though it sure did look like they were firing those things with reckless abandon. Pretty much, if it's too close to you and you hit it and it explodes, you will be hit, so you want kind of a distance away. And this is pretty clear right now that the people that are writing the database are not the same people that, you know, design the cutscenes because there's commentary on the cutscenes in the database. I, I, I must admit that I like that. I don't think we have, oh, we have to go over the UMN stuff. Uh, we do have a little bit more about that. UMN Pulse. It's a navigational signal constantly being emitted from the UMN transfer column. Each column emits a different pulse. So in other words, I assume a, either a wavelength or a, a certain pattern to the wave. So one must receive the pulse from a column located at the destination or the set of pulses from the gate columns located along the jump route during a gate jump. In other words, if you don't have if you're not connected to the pulse I assume you would connect to the pulse or you would at least listen to it then you can't make it through the pulse is important then we have these columns the transport gate has relay points called columns that are located at certain intervals in hyperspace these columns connect every transport gate in the galaxy to one another it is similar to the connections within a neural network. They love the idea of everything being like a brain. Um, I would kind of refer to this as a highway system. It's probably less accurate that way, but it's a lot easier to grasp a highway system than it is the inner workings of a brain. Not all of us have seen brain scans and understand what the hell's going on. Uh, since each column has a limited area of influence, a gate jump cannot be performed from outside that area. In other words, you need to be close enough in order to get in, but I think you've already figured that out based on what happened in the game already. That may just be me, though. UNP, short for UMN Phone. It's a type of wireless communication device, also known as a cell phone. 
Uh, it's common. It's it's common at this time apparently. The connection gear, which Xion uses all the time, also comes with communications functions. But since connection gears are rather expensive, not everybody uses them. Uh, Xion also carries a UMN phone as a backup communication device. So she has her iPhone, and then she also has her BlackBerry for business. That kind of stuff. Uh, since the connection gear uses a special communications line reserved for the military in situations where the central system of the combat intelligence center is congested, it is easier to get a connection via the UNP. So it's more like a satellite phone, uh, I guess, which are permanently connected to things. Like, it doesn't matter where you are, a satellite phone will, will work. So that's the idea of a satellite phone, at least. Uh, fleet design department might be new. They design warships. It's a part of Vector. I don't remember if we saw that. If not, you know, it doesn't take long to go through it. Uh, the rest of this we have seen. Ah, uh, just one more. The 117th Marine Division, a Federation Marine Corps division assigned to escort the cruiser World Glenday, which is apparently a cruiser now. Since the division's headquarters was not in close proximity to the Federation bases, resupply of their equipment was delayed. Nobody around to give you more stuff. And that is it for the database. Uh, we can now actually go back to the real world and try to escape these guys. Uh, we have more or less done what we need to do on the on the World Blend Day. We just need to get out of here. But instead of just leaving, we're gonna find everything. We're gonna go on a massive treasure hunt. As you can say, now that we have the vaporizer and can blow shit up. Uh, you can't hit me from here, but I can do this. It slows him in the field, and in the battle, we get critical to start. Let's. Well, I was, wasn't sure you were going to say anything. Uh, let's go ahead and do what damage I can. I might be able to finish him off here with the spell ray. I think I only need like what, 108. And he's dead. Something like that. 108, was that enough for the victory? Down he goes! Okay, let's go I called the number. I'm psychic like that, I guess. Uh, these goblins, they aren't really worth the effort to try to get anything from them. As you can see, they only give you two tech points and nothing else. I actually... Before I forget, I should probably level up Cosmos's magic. Well, ether. She, yeah, it's weird to think of an android having magic, but she has ether. And that somehow makes more sense. Uh, she has mode A7, which uh, focuses on physical attack. Now I have a choice of down dexterity, uh, which will, you know, decrease enemy's dexterity, as you might think. But I'm going to go for down force, uh, physical attack down for all the enemies. Oh, sorry, just one enemy. But yeah, that's that's the idea. Down force. And now she only has three ether points, but that will do for now. Uh, we never really went over Xion uh, and Cosmos in terms of their equipment. So here's what Xion has equipped. I might have gone over that briefly. Uh, so here's another brief look at it. Physical defense plus three on the uniform. Protector gives her another plus two physical defense. And her scope lets us save enemy HP. And the MWS is awesome because it lets her do anything. Otherwise, uh, she'd be crappy. Can I actually do anything? No, I don't want me to do anything. I was hoping I could spin the camera or something, but no, not this game. Uh, Cosmos. Cosmos has the FG shot with KGS 10V ammo. I don't know if that stands for 10 volts or whatever, but that's the ammo that she uses in her little minigun that we never use because it requires ammo. Uh, she's got the D unit V1. For physical defense plus four. Spoiler alert, there'll be other D units that we find throughout the whole thing. Uh, she's also got uh, dexterity up with the blue ring and evade up with kobold ring. Kind of strange that they would have kobold in a game that's designed like this, but what are you going to do? Uh, 